Hallo, Boa Noite, herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums. Ich freue mich sehr, dass so viele gekommen sind für eine weitere Veranstaltung der Reihe Lecture und Film, Tropical Underground, das brasilianische Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos. Und wir haben ähm, neulich unsere Webseite jetzt komplett, es also, war schon online, aber das war noch nicht so, ähm, wie Sie jetzt sehen können. Ähm, hier ähm, können Sie das ganze Programm von der Lecture auch sehen und besonders wichtig ist, dass man auch alle Mitschnitte von der vorherigen Lecture auch äh, online ansehen kann. Man hat hier so die... Ähm, YouTube-Links. Deswegen empfehle ich sehr, dass alle, die äh, irgendeine Lecture von dieser Reihe verpasst haben, können Sie sich diese Videos ähm, anschauen. Ähm, genau, ähm, ich sollte auch nicht vergessen, mich zu bedanken bei unserer Kooperationspartner, weil hier im, im Filmmuseum ähm, machen wir schon ähm, diese Lecture seit vielen Jahren, aber besonders mit einer Kooperation mit dem Institut für Theater, Film und Medien an der Goethe-Universität und dem ähm, Exzellenzcluster Normative Orden, Or Ordes. Und ähm, das ist auch dank dieser Kooperation, dass wir dieser freie Eintritt hier ähm, möglich haben. Ähm, ich will nicht zu so viel reden, ich will nur kurz zwei Hinweise auf unsere weitere Programm hier im Filmmuseum, weil heute ist unsere sozusagen unsere letzte, letzte Veranstaltung dieser Wintersemester. Dann haben wir eine Pause, bis wir äh, mit dem Sommersemester wieder anfangen und dann ähm, von April bis Juli weitere Veranstaltungen hier im Filmmuseum haben. Aber währenddessen, äh, für die, die weitere äh, brasilianische oder lateinamerikanische Filme hier sehen wollen, kann ich zwei Veranstaltungen sehr ins Herz legen. Und zwar erstens hier äh, Ende Februar, am 25. Februar, zeigen wir den Film Vasanchi von Daniela Thomas, einer brasilianischen Regisseurin, ähm, die bekannt ist äh, für ähm, Arbeit auch ähm, in, in Bühnenbildern und äh, Ausstellungsmachen und sie hat ähm, auch schon bei Filmen mitgemacht mit Walter Salis und sie hat jetzt ähm, ihren ersten ähm, ähm, Spielfilm, so, äh, wo sie alleine als Regisseurin äh, gedreht hat und den Film zeigen wir hier am 25.02. Es war vorgesehen, dass die Regisseurin auch ähm, äh, anwesend sein würde, aber das sieht so aus, als sie nicht mehr an dem Datum kommen würde. So, ähm, das halten wir noch als ähm, angefragt, aber es lohnt sich auf jeden Fall den Film zu sehen. Und deswegen würde ich sehr empfehlen, dass Sie am 25.02., so am Sonntag, ähm, Viertel nach Art, ähm, kommen. Und im März äh, haben wir, wie gesagt, keine Lecture-Termine hier von der Tropical Underground-Reihe. Aber ich kann schon ähm, vorab sagen, dass wir eine Reihe zu lateinamerikanischem Kino haben werden, äh, in Kooperation mit dem MMK und die Ausstellung A Tale of Two Worlds, die gerade im MMK läuft, Museum für Moderne Kunst. Und deswegen, das äh, Programm kommt äh, in den nächsten Wochen äh, online und dann auch äh, hier im Museum. Können Sie sich anschauen, alle Filme, die wir dann im März ähm, zeigen werden. Und ähm, dann geht es weiter am äh, 12. April mit der Lecture Tropical Underground. Ähm, und deswegen wollte ich schon sagen, dass äh, währenddessen können Sie sich ähm, auch andere lateinamerikanische Filme hier anschauen. Ähm, genau, ich äh, wollte auch... Ganz kurz noch zu unserer Webseite. Ich wollte noch hinweisen, dass die ähm, Ausstellung Variationen des wilden Körpers hier im, äh, nebenan im Weltkulturmuseum noch ähm, ein paar Wochen läuft. Bis oh, das Datum ist gar nicht. 11. März ist es, ne? Bis 11. März läuft die Ausstellung noch. Deswegen wollte ich auch empfehlen, das ist auch nicht mehr so lang. Und äh, das nächste Mal, äh, dass wir uns hier treffen für die Lecture, wird die Ausstellung schon vorbei sein. Deswegen wollte ich auf jeden Fall noch hinweisen, für die, die die Ausstellung noch nicht gesehen haben, es lohnt sich sehr, die Fotografien von Viveiro de Castro im Weltkulturmuseum anzuschauen. Okay, ich glaube, das war es von meiner Seite. Ähm, ich mache jetzt hier zu mit dem Dings. Kann ich das? Und ich habe jetzt die Präsentation und Vincent Rediger wird unsere Gäste für heute Abend vorstellen. Vielen Dank. Ja, guten Abend. Da die, Vorstellung, äh, die Ausstellung gerade noch ein Thema war, wollte ich darauf hinweisen, dass es da auch noch eine Finissage geben wird. Nämlich am äh, Donnerstag, 8. März um 19 Uhr. Da wird es auch ein Gespräch geben 
mit dem äh, Ethnologen Roland Hardenberg, der ein Kenner des Werks von Viverus de Castro ist. Und ähm, es sieht so aus, als ob uns dann auch Susanne Pfeffer da noch mit ihrer Präsenz beglücken würde, die Direktorin des Museums für äh, moderne Kunst. Eintritt frei, äh, anschließend Empfang. Also es gibt was zu trinken. Ja. Uh, so, now I, I switch to English. Um, <clears throat> The, we've been talking a lot about cannibalism in this series, um, actual cannibalism, cultural cannibalism, and uh, we, we've been pitching the whole Tropical Underground event uh, by through a, a provocative question, namely, do the indigenous people of the Amazons actually eat their enemies, or is that just a story that they tell to anthropologists who uh, come and, and research them? Um, I've got a lot of angry emails from anthropologists when we put out that question and uh, so it's it's a bit uh, ambiguous and easily misunderstood um, but it's a serious question and as you've noticed uh, if you've uh, been present for some of the previous events in the series uh, cultural anthropophagy is a key concept in Brazilian culture it's a, a concept that was introduced by Oswald de Andrade in his uh, Anthropophagic Manifesto in, the, in 1928 um, and uh, revitalized in the 1950s and 60s through various avant-garde movements, most notably the Tropical, uh, Tropicalia movement, but it was also key to the aesthetics and poetics of the directors of the Cinema Marginal. And um, the, the whole debate and discourse about cannibalism in Brazilian culture, of course, has a Uh, subtext or has a sort of an urtext uh, of reference, which is a book which was written by somebody who actually came from this region, Hans Staden, um, a German soldier uh, in, uh, I think, Portuguese employee who was captured by the Tupi, um, uh, a supposedly cannibalistic um, tribe on the coast of Brazil, lived to tell the tale and wrote one of the first great bestsellers in the history of printed literature, uh, which was Stalin's book about Brazil. And that book pretty much uh, locked in the perception of um, uh, Brazil as a country of anthropophagic indigenous uh, people, a motive that then had a certain career in European thought, uh, was further propagated, but also ironically uh, commented upon by Michel de Montaigne, who wrote an entire treatise about cannibalism uh, making the point that the truly civilized people are actually the cannibals and um, not the Europeans who look upon the or frown upon the cannibals uh, with disdain. Um, and so cannibalism has, has been a running subtext of this entire series. Now it comes to the surface through uh, Nelson Pereira Dos Santos, como era gostoso me francés, uh, how tasty was my little Frenchman, uh, which goes back to the early areas of uh, the colonial adventure and um, the kind of perspective that uh, Staden introduced into um, the narratives about Brazil um, uh, through his book. Um, our speaker tonight, Lucien Aguib, is someone who just made, first made a name for, for herself in Brazil as a specialist for European and Japanese cinema. Uh, her first book was a book on Werner Herzog, and her doctoral thesis was a book on Nagisa Oshima. Um, and then she moved to Europe uh, and uh, became um, known as a scholar of Brazilian cinema and more uh, also, more broadly speaking, of world cinema. Uh, Lucia Naguib um, obtained her first professorship at the University of Leeds, a uh, um, professorship for world cinema, and she later moved to the university where she still teaches, the University of Reading, um, uh, where she uh, teaches cinema studies with a particular focus on Brazilian cinema still, but uh, with a broad horizon um, Uh, that encompasses the entirety of what now is known as world cinema. Uh, Lucia Naguib is the editor of a book series published by I.B. Torres, which is dedicated to world cinema, and her own most recent monograph um, 
is entitled Words Cinema and the Ethics of Realism. So again, a very broad perspective that combines film history with uh, film theory. But she continues her work on uh, Brazilian cinema, which by the way, is documented in a, in a variety of book-length publications dedicated to the Cinema Novo and, and other strands of, of Brazilian cinema history. Um, and she's currently directing, I think the project is still ongoing, um, a project that covers um, uh, a variety of strands of Brazilian uh, film history. Uh, if you remember Stefan Solomon's presentation in um, this series uh, on uh, Ivan Cardoso's uh, O Segredo da Mumia, that's a part of that project. It's something that came out of the project that, that Lucia directs. But the project also en uh, encompasses fascinating uh, aspects such as the re reconstruction of historical performance practices in Brazilian cinemas. That's a part I uh, would like to see and we need to find a way to bring you here with this uh, with this particular part of the project. So uh, Lucia, without doubt, is one of the greatest uh, um, scholars uh, of Brazilian cinema currently working, but she's also uniquely positioned to um, place uh, her uh, thoughts on Brazilian cinema within the broader um, uh, perspective of the study of world cinema. Nelson Pereira de Santos is the film tonight. Luciano Aguip, thank you so much for coming here and for introducing us to that film. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. It's showing minus one on my phone. So thanks so much for braving the cold to uh, attend uh, this lecture. Thanks so much, uh, Vincent and um, Laura, uh, for having me here, for organizing this beautiful section for this wonderful, fantastic series uh, that brings so many uh, fascinating points of view on films that have already been, been really uh, well discussed, but in hindsight we always discover more. And this is that kind of film. Um, and I'm very thankful that Vincent's already um, advanced a number of questions that are going to be key to my uh, approach, including all these uh, um, Renaissance literature that um, spread the word about the men eating um, Indians, native Brazilians. Um, OK, well, without further ado, let me uh, get to grips with uh, the paper tonight. Um, and actually, it goes back to the project that Vincent was just uh, mentioning a while ago about um, reassessing the history of Brazilian cinema, but from an intermediate perspective. What is intermediality is the interaction of different media and art forms within cinema, and sometimes outside cinema. For example, the uh, theatrical prologues that used to precede the screening of silent films in Brazil, they are also being studied in our film. So we are trying to cover all the eras of Brazilian cinema from an intermediate perspective. And um, the, the, the late 70s and uh, the late 60s and 70s is one of those periods. Um, this particular talk uh, will draw on tropicalist intermediality as a means to gain a deeper insight into the political contribution made by this film, Como Era Gostoso Meu Francês, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, which was directed um, in 1970, but only launched and screened in 1971 due to problems with the censorship at the time, uh, and directed by Nelson Pereira dos Santos. Um, I will argue that beyond its sensational focus on cannibalism, the film's intermediate structure under the influence of tropicalism brings about a new dimension of hybridity and transnationalism hitherto absent from the cinema novel agenda. Shot in the most repressive period of the military dictatorship then reigning in the country, the film resorts to the allegorical discourse that had become a staple among cinema novel directors, prevented from directly addressing the political problems of their day. Thus, the story is set at the dawn of the nation in the year 
of 1557 uh, when Calvinist Admiral Nicolas de Villegagnon and his company set foot in the area of today's Rio de Janeiro in the Guanabara Bay and erected the fort of Coligny in an attempt at usurping Brazil, which they called Antarctic France, from the hands of the Portuguese. I don't know what I'm showing there. Um, many of the film's episodes are blatant allusions to the systematic torturing and murdering of political prisoners and activists taking place in Brazil at that time. The film also contains mentions in the form of title cards to the extermination of entire Indian nations, which resonate with the massive displacement and massacre of indigenous populations then being carried out to make room for the Trans-Amazon Motorway, one of the military regime's most disastrous projects. Both for the storyline and the general characterization, the film draws on the Renaissance traveler's account, such as those by the adventurer from Hessen, Hans Staden, that Vincent has mentioned, uh, the Huguenot explorer Jean de Léry, the Franciscan abbot André TV, Jesuit missionaries José de Anchieta and Manuel da Nóbrega, and Portuguese governmental authorities such as Mendy Sá, with their varying degrees of benevolence or mistrust towards the indigenous habits. Not accidentally, this is the same literature that had inspired the Brazilian modernists of, uh, in the 1920s and provided the basis for, for the anthropophagic movement, whose principles are detailed in Osor de Andrade's famous anthropophagic manifesto of 1928 which champion, champions the devouring of imported cultural and artistic techniques in order to change them into export products. Um, in the film, however, one would look in vain for any signs of the modernist metaphoric anthropophagy, finding instead a candid portrayal of historical literal cannibalism with little to recommend or to condemn about it. Whilst not partaking in the modernist or romantic indigenous utopia, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman also refrains from surrendering to the somber skepticism that had engulfed most Cinema Nova productions after the 1964 military coup, which put an abrupt and unexpected end to the revolutionary hopes hitherto entertained by the Brazilian left-wing intelligentsia. None of the characters, least of all the Frenchman in the title, he's called Jean in the title, stands for the director's alter ego, retreated to endless soul searching after the revolutionary debacle, as exemplified by Paulo Martins, the tormented hero of Glauber Rocha's 1967 Terre in Transi, in Transed Earth. Have you shown this film in the series? So you will remember that figure of Paulo Martins, that tormented and ambiguous um, anti-hero. Characters like him had proliferated in the post-coup cinema novel films, appearing even in Nelson Pereira dos Santos' own Fome de Amor, Hunger for Love, dating from the, the same year as Rocha's film, 1967. In contrast, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, with its warm colors, dazzling cast, performing in full nudity, as you have seen, on pristine beaches, exudes an atmosphere of liberation, which points to a different and more positive political strategy. In this talk here, I shall test the hypothesis that the film draws on intermediality as a platform where the utopian impulse, provisionally disrupted by Brazil's political downturn, could continue to thrive. The film's multi-perspectival multi structure derives, I will argue, from the self-revealing and self-standing form in which its raw materials are presented. For example, this. You're going to see a number of title cards like this in the, in the film. 
Um, here um, is a, a quote from the book uh, by Hans Staden, um, which is not just a source for the fictional plot, but actual chunks of the text are displayed in the form of title cards, as you can see here, alongside drawings representing uh, Staden's plight, extracted from Jean de Lery's book, History of a Voyage to the Land of Brazil, which appears as stills occupying the, the entire screen. Several other 16th century letters, poems, decrees, and testimonials by French and Portuguese colonizers are shown in the form of title cards or voiceover commentary, or even in the mouth of the, the characters, often in contradiction with the images and between themselves, thus multiplying the narrative layers that preserve their own original semantic agency. All these interferences are purposely designed to undermine the specificity of the medium, causing the film to constantly mutate into poetry, epistolography, drawing, and other forms of communication. In itself, this technique was not entirely original, as it resonated with the aesthetics of collage introduced by tropicalism just a couple of years before, radically inflecting the visual arts, theater, music, and not least, films produced in Brazil at that time. As much as in How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, anthropophagy was central to the tropicalist Weltanschauung as a means to legitimize their indiscriminate appropriation of low and high cultures, artistic and non-artistic media, popular and experimental genres. Tropicalism as a movement, however, was born from cinema, and more precisely from the aforementioned entranced earth. Here, I think I'm showing a picture uh, where the big chief, Queen Yambebe, uh, is in the center of that circle of uh, women singing, uh, and Hans Staden, on the right-hand side, is begging for his life to be spared. Um, so tropicalism as a movement uh, was born from cinema, uh, and more precisely, from the aforementioned entranced earth. It is Caetano Veloso, the mastermind of tropicalism in music, who recounts the kind of epiphany he experienced when watching this film and a particular scene within it in which the protagonist, Paolo Martins, covers the mouth of a member of the working class and accuses him of being illiterate, alienated, and incapable of ever governing the country. You may remember that very striking scene. For Caetano Veloso, this scene decreed the death of left-wing populism, liberating his mind, and I quote from his book, Tropical uh, uh, Truth, which says um, his mind was liberated um, uh, to see Brazil squarely from a broader perspective, enabling new and undreamed of critiques of an anthropological, mythic, mystical, formalist, and moral nature end of quote. Coming full circle by inflecting cinema, tropicalist inspired multimedia procedures in How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman ruptured the attachment to medium specificity that had hitherto characterized political cinema, not only by endowing other media with narrative agency, by, but also by deconstructing the unified figure of the auteur held as the supreme creator in the early cinema novel days. As well as in the story's allegorical pot uh, potential, director uh, Nelson Pereira dos Santos nourished, nourished a genuine interest in the figure of the anthropophagic Indian and the wars waged at this early stage of the nation. As he recounts in the extras of the DVD containing the recently restored version of How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, the initial spark for the film 
came from his regular commuting on ferry between Rio de Janeiro and Niterói. I don't know if you've ever done that. Um, and thinking about the Indians who once inhabited the area. Um, I've reproduced the picture here. It's an old picture, but you can see the, the blue arrow showing the corner where the fort of Coligny was once located uh, in the 16th century. So yeah, he used to pass there by, by ferry and thinking about those scenes. But he was also influenced by the book by Claude uh, Lévi-Strauss, Triste Tropique. Um, in particular, the passage in which Lévi-Strauss contemplates the rocky island in the Guanabara Bay, where the fort of Coligny was once erected, in the blue arrow there, imagines the French misadventures in Brazil in the 16th century and exclaims, quel scénario, that is, what a film it would make. This may explain the choice of a Frenchman for the title role of a story that stems essentially from Hans Stalin's account of his narrow escape from cannibalism in the hands of the Tupinamba in Brazil. Jean is nothing but a translation of Hans in, in German. Um, Nelson justifies this choice by the fact that the French, and I'm quoting him, participated directly in the Brazilian colonization and were therefore a more interesting object than a German for the appreciation of a cultural shock. End of quote. Another decisive factor is that the film was originally a French co-production. However, it never came to fruition. The cannibalistic theme, in turn, goes back to um, Nelson's adaptation of Graciliano Ramos' Vida Seca's Barren Lives of 1963 shot at the border between Pernambuco and Alagoas states, where another of Ramos's novel, Caetés, is set. And the origin of Caetés is the famous anthropophagic feast held by the Caeté Indians, in which Brazil's first bishop, Dom Pedro Fernandes Sardinha, and his companions were devoured, leading to the extermination of this ethnic group by the Portuguese. So they, the Portuguese reacted by simply exterminating all uh, that group. Um, a, a, an interesting anecdote about this bishop is that Sardinha, his surname, means sardine. You know, so yeah, very fitting for eating. Anyway, um, I'm quoting uh, Nelson Pereira dos Santos here who, uh, when he said, um, Graciliano Ramos wrote his novel in an attempt to recover Brazilianness, as if he were screaming, we are all Indians. He was trying to establish an internal point of view and find within, him, find within him, himself what could have survived from Brazil's early Indians, an Indian capable of devouring a bishop, and make him feel as a man of his time. I found this starting point interesting, although I did not draw on Hamus's story, which is psychological. It's not about cannibalism, Hamus's novel. The connection between the Bishop Sardinia episode and national identity is in fact a modernist idea enshrined in Oswald de Andrade's 1928 Anthropophagic Manifesto, which is dated from this very inaugural moment, that is to say, the year 374 since the devouring of the Bishop Sardinia. So it's the foundation of the Brazilian people dates back to this historical fact. And the manifesto goes on to proclaim, only anthropophagy unites us socially, economically, philosophically. <clears throat> Whilst drawing on these approaches, Nelson Pereira dos Santos gave to the anthropophagic identity a new open-ended interpretation inflected by the situation he was in at the time 
With the re recrudescence of the military regime after the introduction of the Institutional Act No. 5 in December 1968, many Brazilian filmmakers and artists were exiled in Europe. Um, Nelson Pereira dos Santos had also sought refuge, but inside Brazil, in the historical town of Paraty, today a popular tourist resort, but in those days a remote abandoned village. And this is how Helena Salen, um, uh, Nelson's biographer, describes it. She says, the film is now Parachi, a pretty colonial town with narrow lanes and secluded corners, calm, almost paradisiac, on the seaside south of Rio. The town itself is a film set. Um, and then he goes on to say, um, away from the cold and bitterness of the European exile, enjoying the sun and the beach, and above all, continuing to create. Um, so he was not in Europe, but still able to create in that kind of refuge in Parachi. The tribe referred to by Elena Salain was formed by the crew and cast of the three films that Nelson directed in Parachi and its surroundings. Asilo Muito Louco, uh, The Alienist, 1970, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, and Quem é Better, Who Is Better, 1972. Living in this retreat in the manner of a hippie community, Nelson's team thus continued to enjoy in their own way the freedom suppressed by the uh, conservative turn in Brazil. In particular, sexual freedom championed by the modernists as constitutive of the national character and represented by the phallic symbol of the Brazil wood from which the country got its name became almost palpable in how tasty was my little Frenchman. The film's own title qualifies the protagonist as tasty in a pun with the taste of his flesh, savored by his Indian lover, Seboy Pepe, in the final cannibalistic feast. I'm not uh, spoiling anything, because this is already in the title, how tasty was my little Frenchman, so you can guess that he's gone. <laughs> so, um, but the, the camera also relishes in highlighting uh, the, the male character's um, um, sexual attributes um, in a pioneering display of uh, male frontal nudity in Brazilian cinema. It was the very first time in which male uh, frontal nudity was shown in Brazilian cinema. More significantly to my analysis, sexual and cannibalistic intercourse are used in the film to fuse characters, whatever their origin, into a single universal humanity. This can be observed in the egalitarian treatment dispensed to the Tupi, French, and Portuguese cultures, achieved through recourse to the intermediate properties of cinema. Granting autonomy to its various sources, even allowing for other languages such as French and Tupi to prevail over Brazilian Portuguese, the film promotes the dissolution of national identity, proposing instead a supranational and multicultural platform on which to retrieve the Cinema Novo's lost political program. Uh, just a minute. Uh, before I show a clip of the film. Um, I think I'm far advanced. I shouldn't have gone that far. Uh, the intermediate construction of How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman relies on an inventive take on its Renaissance sources. Even before the initial credits, the spectator is presented with the reading in voiceover of a section of Villegagnon's letter to Calvin, dated 31st March, 1557, that says, um, here, no, where is it? Here, okay. The country was all wilderness and untilled. There were no houses, no roofs, nor any use of wheat. On the contrary, 
they were wild and savage people, remote from all courtesy and humanity, utterly different from us in their way of doing things and in their upbringing, without religion, nor any knowledge of honesty or virtue, or of what is just or unjust, so that it seemed to me that we had fallen among beasts bearing a human countenance. In this passage, Villegagnon is resorting to what Christian Maroubi termed a negative rhetoric, a technique in vogue in the 16th century and equally apparent in Montaigne's positive assessment of, of the anthropophagic Amerindians, as seen in his greatly influential essay of cannibals. For example, when he says, and you can read here, I should tell Plato that it is a nation wherein there is no manner of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no science of numbers, no name of magistrate or political superiority, no use of service, riches or poverty, no contracts, no successions, no dividends, no properties, no employment, but those of leisure, no respect of kindred, but common, no clothing, no agriculture, no metal, no use of corn or wine. As you can see, rather than to the savages, Montaigne's definition of this, um, of, of the Indians in this excerpt applies through negation to his own society. The Indians themselves remain entirely idealized and their social uh, structure ignored for Obviously, um, they had occupations, agricultural activities, kin relations, and laws, but they are dismissed as non-existent. This procedure of changing the other into the negative mirror of oneself becomes a structuring ironic device in the film in which different narrative instances are concomitantly presented to cancel each other out. And I'm going to show you the opening of the film where we hear the reading of this passage of the letter of Calvin. Okay, so um, I would like to talk about the clashing media that we see in this opening. Um, as you could hear, Villegagnon's letter in voiceover informs that 26 mercenaries, incited by their carnal cupidity, had planned to kill Villegagnon. However, the images show, on the contrary, how these rebels, including Jean, are subjected to slave labor. The voiceover narration then claims that Jean was freed from his chain in order to better defend himself during his trial, but instead ran away, threw himself in the sea, and drowned. Here again, the images contradict what the letter sh says by showing the defendant chained to two iron balls being thrown into the sea in a summary execution. So he didn't run spontaneously and drown himself. Uh, he was executed. So the use of Villegagnon's letter, um, dated from a different past, a, a very distant past, 1557, is typically allegorical because it presents an obvious parallel with the current political situation in Brazil where torture and murder of political prisoners had become routine, and their death was of, often portrayed as um, the result of accident or suicide in the official news. Obviously, all the press was controlled by the military. Um, equally allegorical is the image of the female Indians who read themselves uh, of the white gowns imposed on them by Villegagnon soldiers. This, by the way, comes straight from Jean de Léry's book. Uh, but the allegory here takes a feminist turn, reminding us of the symbolic uh, burning of braziers that took place around the world in May 1968. Finally, the tone and style of the uh, voiceover speaker who announces the latest news from the Antarctic 
front sent by Admiral Ville Gagnon are the same as that of the 1960s new reels, newsreels called Atualidades Francesas or French News, which were customarily screened in cinemas across Brazil. The light-hearted, cheerful concerto number no. one for horn by Mozart, played in the background, was another um, was also typical of these newsreels. I remember very well when these newsreels started with the military news about all their wonderful deeds. The, the entire cinema would start booing, but you know the current generation won't remember that. But it was uh, incredible, and there was always this kind of Mozart tone at the background. Um, but obviously this soundtrack is being ridiculed uh, by the contrast that it presents with the rebellion and violence described in the voiceover narration and also in the images uh, that portray persecution and murder. In short, this entire introduction is composed of a parodic collision of dispositives through which images, text, and music constantly disavow one another. Another of the film's most distinctive features is its multilingualism, whose purpose is not only to respect the characters' different origins, but also to change them into unconscious vehicles of their cultural heritage. Jean, the Frenchman, is played by an Italian-Brazilian actor called Arduino Colasanti, whose foreignness is evidenced by the contrast his white skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair present with the Indian's copper-brown skin and black hair and eyes. The other important European character in the film is the French tradesman played by Colasanti's father, Manfredo Colasanti. And there is going to be, better not advance what happens between the two. Anyway, uh, when Jean is captured by the Tupinamba, the method these employ to establish his nationality and whether or not to kill and eat them um, uh, or him is particularly telling of the role of language in the film. And I'm going to show another very short clip here. <clears throat> Um, as you can see, uh, the, the, the way that they devised to uh, establish the identity of these people, uh, both one of the Tupinamba warriors and then uh, the great chief, Queen Yambebi, is to point to their own tongues and summon them to, to speak, both Jean and the other two Portuguese. What is not translated here is what Jean then says, which is a strophe of Etienne Jodel's poem, um, Odes sur les singularités de la France Antarctique, d'André TV, or Ode on the Singularities of André TV's Antarctic France. The Portuguese, in turn, their speech is translated. They recite a recipe of lamprey stew. In an unequivocal, though obviously unintended, allusion to the indigenous cannibalistic rituals, given that the lamprey must first be killed with one blow on the head before being cooked. Just like the war prisoners are killed by the Tupi natives with a single bow blow of the Ibirapema, that club that they use there. The comic effect of these speeches derives from the fact that they are delivered in an automatic, detached manner by the speakers who have no share in the authorship of their words, being instead the mere vehicle of a pre-existing text. As such, they constitute the perfect figuration of what Michel Foucault had famously defined as the author function. That is to say, a disembodied author, devoid of an essence, whose role is to characterize the existence, circulation, and operation of certain discourses within society. They also resonate with Barthes, who declared the death of the author in modern literature 
which he defined as nothing but a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centers of culture. Not accidentally, Foucault's and Barthes' demise of the author had taken place just a few years before How Tasty was made, as a political act that qualified the author, in the words of Barthes, as the epitome and culmination of capitalist ideology. In tune with this idea, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman denies individual, individuality to historical agents in order not to diminish their responsibility in the events, but to highlight the prevalence of the context over the individual. That is to say, over the heroicized protagonist as portrayed both in conventional cinema as in um, and in earlier cinema novel works in which the hero functioned as the spokesperson for the almighty auteur. In How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, there is an obvious parallel between reducing the character to a mere function and disavowing the film's authorship, in that the film text itself is composed by a multiplicity of voices from diverse origins and media as if the director himself were simply regurgitating pre-existing texts. The self-destructive potential of such a procedure is evident, as the medium is denied autonomy as conveyor of meaning and, ultimately, truth. Nothing could be more opposed than this to the figure of the auteur hailed by Glauber Rocha at the dawn of Cinema Novo as a noun meaning the creator of films who heralds a new kind of artist for our time. Going back to the use of uh, the ode by Jodel, a member of the Pleiade group, which is dedicated to André TV. Its use can also be seen as political insofar as it compares the savage and civilized man in a manner largely favorable to the former, that is to say, the savage, as Afonso Arinos de Melo Franco notes. Um, in particular, that passage, if you can read on the right-hand side there, the country we should love would, would find that Arctic France has more monsters, I believe, and is itself more uncivilized than Antarctic France. Those barbarians walk about quite naked, whereas we walk about incognito, powdered and masked. Ces barbares marchent tous nus, etc. That's what uh, Jean repeats over and over again. So the highlighted lines are uttered by Jean in the film, but what precedes them in the actual poem depicts the French as more barbarian and uncivilized than the Indians, demonstrating that the speaker is channeling a discourse entirely against his own interests, as much as the Portuguese unwittingly indicate to the Indians how to cook their own flesh. More pointedly, pointedly, the foreigners' alienated and alienating speeches make that everyone, including the Indians, become members of a single humanity with the same ambitions and needs. Examples of this proliferate in the film. Chief Kunyambebe, portrayed in all his glory in the Renaissance drawings, which inform the characterization his characterization in the film wants cannons to exterminate his Tupiniquin relatives, not the mirrors and other knickknacks offered by the French tradesmen. Jean certainly provides the axis for spectatorial identification and catharsis, given the, the, the screen time he occupies. However, just like his enemies, he's equally moved by greed and does not hesitate to do acts that are very comparable to those, those of the Indians. I'm not going to go further into what happened so as not to spoil your surprise. But between the acts perpetrated by the Indians and those perpetrated by Jean, there is hardly any difference. And you will see that also the weapons that they use are interchangeable. 
A last question to be asked, and I'm going to be finishing very soon, is how the demise of cultural differences, authorship, and member um, and uh, medium specificity can be the carrier of the film's political message. As I have explained in previous writing, intermediality penetrated art and cultural studies in the wake of structuralism and post-structuralism, which replaced ideas of purity, essence, and origin with those of intertextuality and dialogism, as represented respectively by Kristeva and Bakhtin, the latter a defender as much as Foucault of the author as orchestrator of pre-existing discourses. Robert Stamm suggests, furthermore, that intertextual and intermedial studies are necessarily intercultural insofar as they contribute to desegregate and transnationalize criticism itself, as well as to avo abolish unavowed hierarchies between different artistic forms. How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman is transnational from its inception though its French production never actually materialized. The French identity of its protagonist was nonetheless maintained as this suited the interchangeable character of the nation nationalities thematized in the plot. Hans Staden himself, according to his own account, had been the victim of mistaken identity, being taken for a Portuguese for having collaborated with them and for this reason threatened with cannibalism. As much as Frenchman Jean, Staden lived in a globalized world, which thanks to the navigations and discoveries Wallerstein tells us, ha was already a modern world system made of composite subjectivities. This in itself, however, does not secure a political grounding to the film in so far as according to Robert Stem himself, hybridity can easily be recoded as a symptom of the postmodern, postcolonial, and postnationalist moment, um, along with the, the, uh, it, these movements, nihilism and aversion to political programs. Um, a similar criticism is leveled by Roberto Schwartz against Caetano Veloso's attack on left-wing populism in the following terms, and you can see the quotes here. The victory of the counter-revolution in 1964-70 with the ensuing su suppression of the socialist alternatives had propitiated a precocious move from a modern to a postmodern situation in the country, the latter understood as that in which capitalism ceases to be relativized by the possibility of its overcoming. I believe, however, that the openness to hybrid media, forms, and cultures in How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, endowing it with multicultural values as much as commercial appeal, gave Brazilian art and popular cinema from the late 60s onwards a chance to survive under the banner of freedom of thought and expression and the right to belong to the world beyond the nation of Brazil, which had provisionally fallen into the wrong hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now you have the chance to ask questions about the film or about the wonderful introduction by Lucia Najib. So um, yeah, um, if anybody has questions, just raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. And um, yeah, anybody already wants to start with a question? Um, or Vincent wants to start with a question, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me uh, pick up on, on some of the things you said. Um, uh, a key point that you raised is that this film, in a way, continues the allegorical mode and tradition of, of Cinema Novo. Um, Terem Trans, in a way, is an allegory. Um, and uh, you gave this uh, beautiful reading also of, of the, uh, 
the the opening section of the film where uh, which is a pastiche of the of the newsreel and and uh, which has all these tensions between the spoken word and and the image and and provides an allegory of torture and the situation in Brazil um, and I want to get to that in a second but one of the things that struck me also is that this film was produced by a group of people who in a way lived as a community in the place where the film was shot um, and uh, you know apparently had a, a lifestyle that had some commonalities with that of the people depicted in the film and it made me think of um, the the group that um, Scanzella and Bressani formed in Rio de Janeiro a bit earlier uh, the Bel Air uh, production company where they lived together sort of also as a, as a kind of community for albeit a shorter time only about um, five months I think and made seven films in a period um, so there, there seems to be some some kind of analogy you know the group uh, dynamics in filmmaking and, and so it made me think whether or not the film was also an allegory of the filmmaking process um, in that you know the the way the film was made has some commonalities with, uh, you know, what we see in the film. Would you would you agree with that, Nora? Yeah, I think the question of identity is central to the film in that they were trying to experience in their own flesh, in their own bodies, what it was to be those Indians in those mm. days and to be the French in those days. Right. And obviously, the, uh, one of the, the points that most scandalized the Europeans was to see people going about naked mm -hmm. without any clothing. <coughs> um, and... Obviously, Brazil going through that period of extreme conservatism, uh, the movement for property and the family rising in the country, and um, uh, all the, the, the costumes and you know everything, the habits and everything uh, going backwards in, in a way that nobody had imagined. Uh, on the contrary, they thought that Brazil was moving towards the revolution. Um, so what they wanted to do was to, to try to break that conservative wave by going back to the beginning and rewriting history in a different way, um, imagining that they would try to understand both the Indians and the Europeans from their own point of view without a, a, a preformed idea of what they... Uh, they, uh, without taking sides openly, and this is something that mo many of the, the people who wrote about this film uh, were impressed about, because these various sources of information um, very o often leave it open for you to interpret um, who was right and who was wrong. Um, so, but in any case, they tried to put themselves in the position of those Indians. They were, uh, they moved to some of the places which historically is confirmed that both the Tupinambas and the Tupinikins were based. Um, actually, they were in Parachimirim and in the, the region um, north of uh, Sao Paulo, but south of Rio, uh, where there were the, the uh, most uh, numerous contingents of Tupinambas and Tupinikins. Um, and imagine their confrontation with, uh, with the Europeans in their own birthplace. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the actors had to train how to live. So they, they were living naked all the time, even in the colder months of June and July when it's really cool. Um, and uh, they learned how to crouch because if you sit on the ground, you are bitten by ants and things like that. So you, you can't be sitting all the time. So uh, uh, many of the artists... I 
talked about uh, I, I talked about the film with they told me that they needed to train how to how to avoid all these inconveniences of being naked in the jungle obviously it wasn't the jungle like it was in those days it's hard to imagine how it was uh, but anyway there is lots of wood and you know and insects and mosquitoes and all that. Um, on the other hand, they were also trying to understand how the French were interacting. And one aspect I find marvelous in the film is everybody needing to learn each other's language. And you can see that Seboy Pepe already knows some words in French, that Jean has learned uh, some basic tupi. So has done the other tradesman, the French tradesman. So um, I think they they are trying to reconstruct the very origin and formation of the Brazilian people and understanding what the Brazilian identity actually is mm -hmm. from a, a, a point of view that doesn't have preconceptions. No. So picking up on Eduardo Viveros de Castro's key concept, in a way it's an exercise in perspectivism. In, in trying I think to it's very fitting, the perspectivism. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, fr from a contemporary uh, point of view, one of the things that would stand out is that uh, many of the uh, Tupinamba roles are actually being played by, uh, as we will call them, white actors in, uh, in maquillage, in, uh, I'm tempted to call it red face. And... Um, and so, in a way, you could argue it's like a typical Hollywood film because uh, you know all the Indians will be played by white people in in red face. Well, it's, but um, yes, no, um, uh, there are many Indians in the cast. Yes. Many Indians yeah. in the cast, and the other non-Indian, uh, just normal people from Brazil, they have. Um, um, well, Brazil is formed by Europeans, uh, Africans, and Indians, basically. So they uh, had the care to choose those Brazilians who presented the, f the, the physical features of the Indians more clearly. Yeah. For example, Ana Maria Magalhães, but also many friends of Nelson Pereira dos Santos, the mm -hmm. writer um, um, Ana Miranda, she's one of the Indians there. The, there was a question of not having the mark of your bikini, so that <laughs> so they had to be overpainted sometimes to yeah. hide the mark of their bathing suits. Um, but the only really n white person there is the French, and they had to choose a, a, a real Italian. He's an Italian. Um, uh, Arduino Colasanti, and so is his father, Manfredo Colasanti. So there is a parricide there in that he kills his own father in the film. Um, and um, the father wasn't even an actor, but because the first film they've uh, made there before the, the trilogy of Parati was in Angra dos Reis, which is nearby, mm -hmm. and Manfredo had a house there. He was a kind of, uh, you know, ad adventurer living in Brazil, in the, he and his dogs living in Angra dos Reis, and he offered his house to shoot the film Hunger of Love which is the one he did before those three. And in the process of offering his house and uh, the environment and everything, he ended up playing a role in the film in which he spoke Italian because his Portuguese was very bad. Um, and in the film, he speaks French with a strong Italian accent, if perhaps you can notice that. Um, and uh, But it's his own voice. So he had to get to actual foreigners to play the role of the white right. French. Um, at the end of your talk, you quoted uh, Ricardo Schwartz. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, sorry, Rico Roberto Schwartz. And his critique of uh, Caetano Veloso's uh, Tropical Truth and in a way of Tropicalia and, and uh, the consequence the consequences of Tropicalia, which of course include also the cinema marginal. Um, and uh, one could say that what Schwartz offers is a familiar Marxist critique of what I'm tempted to say we used to call postmodernity or postmodernism, 
uh, basically he's calling the Tropicalia movement sellouts and, uh, you know, because they opted for uh, the kind of montage techniques and the kind of visual language and musical language they chose, they sold out and made a critique of capitalism impossible. And your argument, and I understood this to be your main point, is that that is actually not a correct observation and that it uh, completely underestimates the political potential of the kind of stylistic choices that we see in a film like that. Can yeah, you elaborate yeah, I, on that? I, I think, if, yeah, if your description yeah. is is absolutely correct of my point of view. Um, by the way, Roberto Schwartz had already um, leveled that kind of criticism to the modernists already, okay. uh, including... <laughs> Uh, or, or more in particular Oswald de Andrade mm. and his uh, anthropophagic manifesto okay. which he thinks could only be written by somebody with that kind of euphoria for the, the Indians and so on mm. by somebody who actually uh, was not affected by that kind of... Uh, Brazilian contingent mm. um, uh, and was reveling in the profit that the, the coffee was bringing to mm. Sao Paulo, to that yeah. specific situation of Sao Paulo. Yeah. So from the heights of, you know, a very privileged class living out of the, the coffee profits and so on, you can then look down at the Indians and, and say how wonderful they were. Um, he was... Roberto was also very criticized for having said that, and we cannot ignore that the um, those I ideals of the modernists in Brazil ha inspired a number of so-called subversive movements, including all this um, series of films that you've been showing here, and in theater, uh, things like Ojei da Vela, the, the king of the, the candle, and so on. So, um, and Osvaldo Andrade himself, in a later stage, when he became more of a Marxist, he kind of abandoned his yeah. kind of celebration of uh, yeah, he the beca He became a hardcore Stalinist in the 30s. Yeah, maybe he was more interesting before. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's something that the artists themselves were struggling to situate themselves. Uh, but what Caetano Velo was in his case, after the, the collapse of the left-wing um, revolutionary hopes, that's what they, everybody thought was going to happen in Brazil in a few years, it's just a matter of days and Brazil is going to um, become a communist country. We had uh, Jean Goulart in power who had just visited China in a moment when, you know, the, all the, the uh, diplomatic relations from the West were being cut with all those countries with Cuba and so on. And he, vis he, he had just come back from Cuba when the, the military coup took place from from uh, China. So that was a, a tremendous shock for the left-wing uh, in, intelligentsia, the arts, and the, the whole movement there. So uh, w w what Caetano Veloso was saying is that we needed to understand what went wrong. And for him, it was the populist strain of that movement, thinking that the illiterate um, uh, workers' union uh, uh, leader would be able to uh, lead the revolution and take power one day was extremely naive. And that's what Tehin Terezi says uh, to him that shocked him so much as a, a big revelation marking the birth of tropicalism in music. Yeah. Perhaps questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> Niels, please. Well, uh, let me first thank you again for this uh, wonderful talk and introduction. Um, I just wanted to come back to um, the aspect of nudity for a moment, uh, because uh, you made that strong point uh, in the introduction already that that was uh, a first time uh, with uh, frontal nudity, and um, y you've already talked about the, so to speak, uh, conservative backlash on the other side at that moment. So I was just wondering, uh, with the personal impression, some of the, the scenes with the rides and the bathing scenes especially had some voyeuristic or even pornographic quality to me. 
um, if that was an aspect uh, for selling the film or was it more a problem for the conservative Brazilian contemporary audience or could have been a, a problem what was the box office reception of the the film and uh, or um, the, the, well, the, the film was the press talk about the nudity at that time yeah. thank you um, upon completion the film was censored immediately yeah sorry about that so the, uh, and um, so there was a long fight until they managed to get the film released. And at that point, it's just at the dawn of that uh, porno chanchada movement that then would take over the screens in Brazil um, as a commercial strand, and including all the cinemas of the center of Rio and Sao Paulo were totally taken over by very cheap, soft porn kind of films. Uh, in entirely regulated by the censors of the military regime with ridiculous things like you can show one breast of a woman but not two at the same time, so just one. And, and there were, you know, sides and how you could show nudity. In this film, however, what was happening is that they were trying to install a new and entirely liberated society, so free sex, and live like that. So they, obviously, they were having affairs with each other and uh, were trying to, to have a life that had no barriers, no prejudice, everything was possible. So the, the life in community, in, in that kind of community, they really believed that they could start something else, you know, where sex is not prohibited. And it's an age pre-AIDS and all that, so, you know, it, that kind of barrier was not there either. And you, you have to imagine the situation of women in particular, because um, uh, the uh, patriarchy and, and male chauvinism was rife in Brazil and was getting more and more so. So for the women to appear uh, completely naked was something um, incredible. But the men had never appeared. So for them, it was also... So they had to do laboratory work to you know, disinhibit themselves and start not to think about sex when they are all naked together there in the film set. You know, it's just very hard. Uh, so it was a lot of training, but it belonged to a new ethos that they were trying to develop in terms of creating a new and democratic society. Uh, but th there was a lot of study behind that. Uh, the, the man uh, in Basai who does uh, Queen and Baby, the, the chief, the big chief, is a doctor but also an anthropologist. And he studied in the smallest detail all the habits of the Indian. Uh, the, um, he carved the birapema that he uses at the end because he wasn't happy with a any of the ones done for him. And he said, no, that's not how it is. And he carved it himself. And there was the artist who painted the bodies. Obviously, uh, this was very inventive and stylized. It's not exactly how it used to be. But it, it's, uh, um, I forgot his name now. He's died just uh, a few months ago, unfortunately. And um, he he made exhibitions with the paintings that were done. So it was a, an artistic community living together and doing each of them some kind of um, specialism, but also trying to live uh, physically together and exercise a different kind of conviviality. I mean, it is true. It must be some kind of um, world record for full frontal nudity in art cinema. And that I don't think I've ever seen a film that has a naked man in every scene um, uh, or more than one naked man. So it's uh, truly remarkable in that way. Um, uh, can you tell us also something how the film played in Europe and how it was seen in other places? Um, it was a big success. You asked me about the commercial success. It yeah. was 
commercial success. I think the Macunaima was vi even more. In so Brazil, it was a bigger yeah. hit, yes. Uh, but uh, it was a commercial success. Uh, and um, th that kind of film suggested to the military regime, why not invest in that kind of strain, you know, um, porno chanchada and historical films on the other hand. So those, so they started to finance patriotic films that told the story of the emperor who declared the independence of Brazil and things like that with uh, telenovela actors like, um, and things like that. On the one hand, on the other hand, porno chanchadas, so pornographic films, um, and uh, nothing in between, all the things that they were trying to. So uh, in the end, it killed Cinema Novo uh, for making it impossible to make more intellectualized, more. Uh, yeah, but it's true. This is quite, and I know that in the United States it's caused quite a, a stir, and they made many debates. Yeah, don't say. Yeah, they it created fans that still teach, like Richard Pena, who discovered the film then and still teaches, puts it in his course. In Japan, Donald Ritchie became completely fascinated with the film and would also use it to talk about Brazilian cinema. Now, it caused a stir, but I don't think that outside Brazil it had box office results, though. I don't think so. It was difficult to distribute on a large scale. Do we have other questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you. Um, I was wondering a bit about the career of the director, so maybe you could um, um, well share some information about um, uh, how you would situate this film in particular within the career of the director. Thank you. Nelson Pereira dos Santos is one of the most prolific Brazilian film directors. He started, he is a predecessor of Cinema Novo with films influenced by Italian neorealism, uh, Rio 40 Degrees and, um, and uh, Rio Northern Zone. Uh, these two films set in Rio for the first time showed the favela as um, as a realm of poverty uh, in a way that confronted uh, uh, directly what was trying to be produced in Sao Paulo in those days with the Veracruz company, which uh, tried to imitate Hollywood and produce lavish, luxurious films with fabulous cinematography, with uh, crews imported from Italy and from Germany and so on. Uh, and he did this very low budget two films, which were his first two films. And with this, uh, he launched a new kind of cinema that then was picked up by the Cinema Novo directors uh, and turned into what became a more politicized kind of cinema and became uh, Cinema Novo. So the, the, the three foundational films of Cinema Novo are uh, Black God, White Devil, uh, The Guns, and uh, Baron Lies, Vida Secas, by Nelson Pereira dos Santos. So uh, Nelson, Glauber Rocha, and Rui Guerra uh, made those films in the same year, 63, 64, that uh, launched the, the early phase of Cinema Novo. Uh, but Nelson had already started before that with his uh, two films about Rio and the favela. Um, after that, uh, he's, he had a very prolific career. He did a number of films within the Cinema Novo kind of bracket. After the demise of Cinema Novo and after this film, um, he started to make uh, some more literary adaptations, adapting um, Jorge Amado making films in Bahia, making films that talked about um, uh, um, Afro-Brazilian religion, Amuleto de Ogum, and many other films. Uh, so he never stopped making films when many others gave up or moved 
out to to Europe. Um, and then more recently, he started to make documentaries about uh, musicians like Tom Jobim, Vinicius de Moraes. Uh, he's incredibly active. And one explanation for his activity is that he brings in people to work with him that he likes to... Um, to train to become film, become filmmakers themselves, so people like Chizuka Yamazaki and so many others started under him. And um, uh, when I organized that f book, uh, uh, Cinema da Retomada, where we interviewed ninety filmmakers, the first question we asked the filmmakers is. Who is the filmmaker in Brazil who most influenced you? And we always expected it to be Glauber Rocha, but instead it was Nelson Pereira dos Santos. And, and the reason we would ask, but, but why? They said, because he was the first to invite me to work in a film by him. And it's amazing. Glauber Rocha started with Nelson Pereira dos Santos because uh, he was a crazy young man traveling to Rio and pestering everybody saying, I want to make cinema. And Nelson came to him and said, you keep saying you want to make cinema, but you were not making cinema. So, so come to my film and help me carry the cables there, blah, yeah. blah. And he did. And that's how he got some experience in making cinema and could go back and start making Pacho and the other things that he did in Bahia. So it was, he was that kind of uh, formative figure in Brazilian cinema. Very modest, anybody can talk to him. He, you always found him in bars, in restaurants. And, uh, he was a formidable person. He still is. He's very deaf now, so hard to talk to, uh, but still going around the globe and talking to people. A wonderful person. And uh, the, the films are a bit uneven, you know, in terms of quality, but there is always something wonderful about them. Yeah, just to, to add to that, he's turning 90 this year, and Nelson Pereira dos Santos, and there's um, lots of um, retrospectives being organized right now for this year to celebrate. We're trying to show at least one of his films at this next uh, cycle of Latin American films that we're going to do in March. It's not confirmed yet, but uh, the program will come out soon. Um, or, uh, we've been wanting to show more of his films because, as Lucia says, it's very important for Brazilian cinema, and I have the impression not so well known here or not it, as much as he deserved of Finnefa. Let me just call attention to another aspect that's very important in the film, is this reconstructed Tupi language that we hear. That was, uh, obviously all the dialogue was written in Portuguese. And then they asked Humberto Mauro, who is a pioneering Brazilian filmmaker, who made the most famous silent films in Brazilian history, but a passionate nationalist and um, a patriot uh, who very willingly translated everything into Tupi because uh, he studied it all his life and his dream was to make the that film, um, The Discovery of Brazil, spoken in Tupi. Obviously, it's in the... Um, it's at the uh, moment when a sound was being introduced in the cinema, so it didn't really work. But the music is by Villa Lobos, and it was composed. It's that kind of patriotic kind of anthem. Uh, but he translated. So there is also the fact that we are being uh, connected to the very history of Brazilian cinema through the figure of Humberto Mauro writing the dialogue uh, in Tupi. I mean, Manuel de Oliveira was, I think, 103, 106 when he made his last film. So he has yeah. another, almost another 15 <laughs> years to go. Uh, <clears throat> um, I wanted to make another question. Yes, and since we mentioned, um, I had seen the name of Humberto Mauro in the credits and I was wondering about that. And the other name that called my attention in the producers is uh, K.M. Eckstein, um, who had also produced Macunaima and who was a German who was working as a journalist correspondent in Brazil at the time. I was wondering if you know uh, more about his uh, involvement with these people, like how did he become a producer of um, these this films? Um, uh, do you know anything about yeah, it? He, he stepped in when the, the French producer gave up uh, because um, 
the, the uh, Nelson had been going back and forth to France also because you know the situation in Brazil was very dangerous and you never knew how long you could stay here, the moment when you needed to. So there were many people, Glauber was making films in France. And uh, so he, um, uh, the, f the first uh, uh, arrangement for the production was uh, French. However, they found that it would be too risky to have the entire cast naked there. So um, Eckstein stepped in, <laughs> stepped in to pour a little bit of money. But basically, it's an independent production, and people were working almost for free in the film. Anybody else have questions? Thank you so very much indeed for staying until now with this cold outside. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for a wonderful talk and a wonderful discussion.